Okay, um, so I had the privilege of chairing uh, the Clinical Informatics Interest Group over the last uh, year and a half, and uh, I wanted to acknowledge both um, um, Casey and um, um, Casey's uh, contributions to that group uh, in particular. Um, and one of the things as a group that um, I think the case has already been made uh, fairly well is that uh, clinical informatics is really integral to the success of genomic medicine. And so the group has um, started with a mission of supporting uh, an open forum around exchanging lessons related to clinical informatics and also summarizing and disseminating best practices. And so I think you'll see uh, some of the projects that we've been working on um, are in that realm, but we're, uh, we're looking forward to other opportunities and there are many in this area. Um, we, we have um, seen essentially um, summarized in the two previous talks that there are two um, objectives um, that, are, uh, that need clinical informatics to succeed, which is having clear actionable representations of genomic risks and clinical guidance within the EHR, and then also communicating um, those results with patients and exchanging instruction and information between sites of care. And one of the things that is not mentioned, which I think is important, is um, enabling long-term management of genomic risks and long-term access to those results. So I wanted to reiterate one point, which I think the other speakers have made, um, which is there's been a tremendous run-up um, in EHR adoption in the last 10 years, um, but there's two lines here. And the bottom line, um, and this is data reported by ONC, um, is uh, representing the basic EHR system. So there is truly a diverse uh, installed base of EHRs in our communities, um, and most of them are basic. Um, so uh, the comprehensive ones are, represent only about a third of the installed um, EHR systems. And what does that mean? Um, well, there's a, actually a list of features um, which you probably can't read, but the one I wanted to highlight was the one that says decision support at the bottom is lacking in all of the basic EHR systems. So uh, but right off the bat, I think there's a major uh, deficit in infrastructure to deliver the kinds of guidance that we'd like to, to do within the EHR. Um, and we encounter this within our night projects. In fact, one of our sites um, has not only um, had a basic system, but they've turned that system over twice in the, in the time period where they've been active within Ignite. So, um, it's the stability of the systems can be an issue as well over time. So what we've done as a group in the last couple months is started with this idea, well, let's, let's sort of envision um, a little more idealized uh, CLIA compliant uh, genomic data pipeline. Um, and um, this, uh, I think, um, echoes some of what Sandy has presented where you have uh, different stages that the data goes through. It starts in the laboratory um, and then we have a stage that we call genomic escrow where um, it, for a large panel test or sequencing uh, result, you would um, stage the data there and only the data that is actionable would go forward to the EHR, uh, but there needs to be a, a, a com clear compliance storage uh, over the long term where you could potentially reanalyze that data and produce uh, new findings. Um, there are clearly gaps in just about every task within these different stages. Uh, probably the only thing that is, uh, we do fairly well consistently across sites would be specimen ac accessioning and tracking, um, but there are lots of opportunities within these other uh, areas. Um, and the other thing, the other point that I think Sandy made well is that um, these um, tasks can be done within the same health system or uh, many of them can be done within a reference laboratory or even a third party. Those middle two stages, uh, there's lots, of course, of uh, uh, Silicon Valley companies that would like to take care of uh, storing your genetic data for you or uh, doing data interpretation. Um, and so the, the landscape, the commercial landscape is fairly complex in this area. Um, now within Ignite, we are touching on many of these um, and with some of the projects that I'll show you, um, certainly not uh, solving them um, or trying to boil the ocean, but um, at least uh, making some progress um, on some of these areas. Um, so. Um, as a group, we came, to, came up with these major informatics challenges, um, and I think um, in terms of the ones that, that we've been focused, I'm not going to read all of them, but um, in terms of the ones that we've been focused on lately, it's mostly been around delivering clinical guidance based on genetic risks to the right person and place within the workflow. But the rest of them are opportunities for us to, do, uh, to expand our work. 
Um, so um, one of the major tangible products um, that the group has uh, helped with is with a site called CDSKB. This is a designed to be a repository for implementation related clinical decision support. Um, and so it uh, includes screenshots, includes uh, supporting the algorithms, documents, things that um, a site that it was not doing this kind of work could use that uh, to get started. Um, now it's not designed at this point to be exportable plug-in uh, decision support. That is uh, still technically quite difficult with the range of systems that are um, out there. Um, but um, this is, uh, I think, a nice foundation for that kind of work going forward. Um, and uh, just to give you an example, this is this, uh, the search screen. So um, across all the documents we've collected, you can search by um, drug name, you can search by gene, you can search by disease. It's indexed uh, based on those three categories um, or by the type of document um, that is stored. Um, and so within the repository, we have artifacts that are basically um, screenshots of clinical decision support. This is an example from our own institution um, showing um, a screen that's in, in the middle of the prescribing session where um, you might want to switch from prazogrel to, um, from uh, clopidogrel to one of the alternatives uh, based on CPTC-19 results. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things you can do with this particular resource is compare this to uh, something that is trying to do the exact same thing at a completely different institution. So it's sort of a, a way to do comparative informatics. Um, this is actually um, implemented within an EPIC system and is much simpler, but is trying to do the, um, accomplish the same task. Um, there's also um, this clinical decision support that is being generated by Ignite Sites. Uh, this is an example from the GUARD study uh, related to ABL1. And, and there's a number of other uh, documents, and, and it's an open site. You're welcome to go uh, browse through them. So um, the other, uh, I think, uh, nice uh, activity that SIG has been involved with in has been these monthly webinars. Um, we've had a number of experts um, talk on different clinical informatics topics over the last year um, and a half. Um, here's some of them, and I think our, um, we will continue to do this, uh, run this series, and so I encourage everyone in the room to uh, participate. Um, and we've recently started in the last um, uh, couple months looking at this idea of given the idealized version of the data pipeline, what is actually out at our, at our night sites, uh, that's not something we've cataloged yet. And so um, we are um, in the process of putting together not only this framework, which is going to look somewhat like the diagram I showed, um, but also a structured data collection um, to really get at where the gaps are within our own sites. Um, which now cross both, you know, have, we have academic sites, we have non-academic sites, we have community sites. And so it's going to be a nice selection um, and cross-section um, of what um, these different clinical care settings look like uh, from an informatics perspective. Uh, the other activity that is related um, to what we do is um, we've been active in helping um, with some of the activities of the PGX group, uh, mostly around extracting um, uh, drug exposure data or outcome data and doing electronic phenotyping. Um, and so this is a project that we've started in the last six months, um, which is designed essentially to look at um, how often CPIC level A drugs are being prescribed at a number of different institutions. We've, collect, we've uh, now have a group of um, uh, 10 or 11 institutions that are participating. Um, and so this is going to um, allow us to do a couple things. Um, it's it's going to look it's going to look not only at the overall opportunity for pharmacogenomics in particular, um, but also look at prescription trends that um, we should be paying attention to. And so this is an example of some preliminary data we put together at our I3P sites. And um, I want to draw your attention to the middle panel where uh, the VA made a policy decision to change from warfarin to one of uh, to allow their, uh, or encourage their prescribers to use uh, the other NOACs um, or novel oral anticoagulants. And there's been a dramatic drop in warfarin use uh, really in a, a couple month time period um, in early 2015. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that would clearly um, impact the opportunity to tailor warfarin therapy. Uh, whereas in a place uh, like Aurora, which is a large um, integrated health network, um, the, the warfarin opportunity is still very large where the vast majority of their patients are being initiated on, on the traditional medication as opposed to the NOACs. 
So to briefly summarize, we, we have a lot of opportunities to study and address gaps in the data pipeline. We also have opportunities to support comparative effectiveness activities in the network. Um, and one of the uh, areas which I agree with Sandy is very important um, that we could focus on in the future is really more of the user experiencing uh, of accessing genomic data or interpretations within the EHR. Thank you, Josh. And we will have a discussion moderated by Eric Borwinkle at the University of Texas at Houston with the discussants Terry Klein from Stanford University and Karen Albeck of the University of Utah.